ahead and get this this started and uh if y'all have any comments on this uh just just feel free to point that out as we go okay so we're talking about backcountry navigation uh, we're focus mainly on using a map and compass but that's not to say that the uh, the gps doesn't have application i would ask you to think of what you learned tonight as the basics and the foundation that you could then use with your GPS to enhance your, uh, your skill and not rely uh, specifically on GPS. I think Jeremy may say something here at some point about the, the limitations of a GPS. But if you can use that technology in conjunction with some of this basic information we're gonna talk about tonight, I think you're gonna be a much better navigator when it comes to the, to the back country. And the, the map that I'm gonna focus on the most is gonna be what's called the 7.5 minute series, uh, which is, is published by the US Geological Survey. And this shows you just roughly the size that you're gonna see. Um, that's, a, that's a one foot ruler up there. This is spread out on a desk. It's a good size map, but that's the standard as far as the size that you would need for lots of backcountry applications. Uh, if you're on foot, if you're on an ATV, if you're on a horse, this is a pretty standard size to go with. Now there are some other options as well. You're gonna pick up a lot of uh, trail maps in various places and there's not really a standard size. There's not really standard scale for these because normally what they do, there's a, there's a defined area that you need a map of. And so they shrink that or expand it to, to fill in the space and just focus on a, a finite area that's within that natural area that you're going to be using. And uh, incidentally, I'll do a little plug. These, uh, these Highland section maps from the Pine Mountain Trail, they are available now on pretty high quality paper. And they're, I think they're 16 bucks if you're interested in one of these that you're seeing here. But same kind of features, you'll notice that lots of times these are gonna be stripped down. They're gonna have um, a lot of the fluff taken away and just have the information that you need without any of the extra stuff. It's gonna be focused on one particular use. But still the same kind of functions, um, the same kind of, of, of uh, uh, features that these will have, They'll have the contour lines and, and so forth. And then I'm a big fan of the gazetteers. I have one in my car. It's very useful for somebody who finds themselves on back roads a lot. And the gazetteers will also have some of the features that your 7.5 minute series maps will have. It'll have the contour lines. It's more focused on the roads, but you will be able to see the contour and the elevation. Uh, so it, it is a very, another very specialized type of, of map. But these are not very good for any kind of hiking or horseback riding or hunting because they just cover too much area and there's too much focus on uh, things that you don't necessarily need. So if you uh, take a notion to get one of these USGS 7.5 minute series topographic maps that I'm going to be talking about tonight, and, and I do encourage you to do that if there's a particular area that you spend a lot of time in whether it's on your farm or a, a, a spot within the Jefferson National Forest for example I'd encourage you to pick up one of these maps um, there was a time when you could go into certain uh, stores and you could buy these pick out the map that you need and you can probably still do that in some outdoor stores and places like that there used to be a, a place in North Knoxville a store is called the map store and you could go in and you could order all, and, and buy right across the, the counter all kinds of different maps. And it seems like once upon a time, I bought a, a topographic map or two from the, uh, the geology department at the University of Kentucky. So you can still find some brick and mortar places where you can look at these maps and buy them. But, um, but for the most part, th those are getting fewer and farther between. So you're probably gonna have to order um, one of those and this is if you go to the USGS website there are several ways that you can you can order these you can download the maps you can also order a hard copy um, I will tell you that this is not a very user-friendly site and um, and it's kind of frustrating to navigate through 
you may need a uh, an engineering degree just to get through the website, but uh, but it is possible to go in and order these these maps from from that site. All right, looking at uh, at a topographic map, and um, the way we're going to approach this tonight is we'll go uh, first of all look at at just the map alone and what information you can glean from a map and how it would be useful to you. And then we're gonna have a few slides just on using a compass alone and how that could be a good skill to have. And then finally, what we're gonna do is combine the two at the end and talk about how you could use a map and compass together. But starting out with the, the map, and again, this is seven and a half minute series from the USGS. And the seven and a half minute series, that just refers to the size of the map. Um, your latitude and longitude lines are in degrees, minutes, and seconds. And so going across, if you, if you look at those measurements, it's gonna be from this line to the line at the far left, it's gonna be seven and a half minutes. And from the top to the bottom, it's gonna be seven and a half minutes. So that's, uh, that's just the, the standard that we're looking for. Each of these is gonna have a name. Each of these maps, the quadrangle is gonna have a name such as flat gap. Um, normally that name will be based on some prominent feature within that quadrangle. And the nice thing that I like about these is if you wanna find what's over here, what map would pick up where this one leaves off, the name will be down here about halfway down. If you wanna see what map picks up here at the corner, we can look and it's the quadrangle called the Jenkins East. So if I was gonna buy this uh, quadrangle to complement this map up here in the corner, then I would look for Jenkins East. That would be the name of it. You'll also see some indices for your uh, latitude and your longitude. Uh, and that, again, that's gonna come in handy if you can pin down a particular spot. You can plug these into your GPS unit and get a little more function out of that. There are also some grids, little plastic grids that you can purchase that are uh, calibrated just to these maps. And with those, you can find a specific spot and find out what the latitude and longitude are. And you can plug those into your GPS. Uh, looking at the bottom right of a uh, of this particular quadrangle, you're gonna have some information on the roads. You, you can see what a foot trail looks like versus a, a Jeep trail or a, a heavy duty road. Again, you're gonna see that name again and uh, the name of that quadrangle. And here at this corner, you're gonna see that this particular map that picks up at this corner is just called Wise. And so if you were looking to buy that, you would know exactly what you're looking for. Um, Underneath the name here, down towards the bottom, this is very important information for around here. This tells what this map, what year this map is based on. And then a lot of them will be revised from aerial photographs later on. But I can tell you when I worked for the Kentucky Division of Forestry in the late 1990s, many times we would be out and be looking at one of these maps that was from the 50s and be looking for a ridge that's supposed to be there according to the map, but now that ridge is a surface mine. So that's important information to have. When this was updated, um, this is a is a snapshot. This map is gonna be a snapshot of a particular year. So it, it's good to know when that last snapshot was taken. This is at the center, the bottom of the map. You're gonna have your scale you're gonna be able to, uh, to trace out how much a mile is, how much a half mile, and then in thousands of feet, that's gonna be broken down, kilometers. Um, all the seven and a half minute series, they have the same scale, and that's one to 24,000. So in other words, if I took my ruler and I stretched out an inch on this map, and then I went out on the ground and measured that out, that would be 24,000 inches. Uh, to make it a little more usable, just remember that one inch is 2,000 feet. So anytime that I draw an inch on here, that's gonna be the equivalent to 2,000 feet on the ground. So that's, that's good information to know. Another uh, very vital piece here is gonna be your contour interval. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, but that's gonna be the uh, distance and elevation from one of these contour lines to the next. 
And then just um, as far as the relative location of what this map would represent, then right here, we're gonna have a, um, an indication of where that map fits in to the region. But those are just some of the things that you'll see at the bottom. But again, this contour interval, remember that this one is 40 feet. That's gonna be, that's gonna be important. Another thing that you're going to see at the bottom is some variation between the grid north or the true north and the magnetic north. And it's, it's just a fact that um, if we're pointing towards the North Pole, that's not necessarily going to be the same place that the magnet is pointing because the, the magnetic um, features underground, it's, it's not exactly at the North Pole. So there's a little bit of variation. And grid north would just be, grid north is pretty close to true north, but it's gonna be based more on how the map is laid out. The, the map is relative um, to, to grid north, and that's how those lines are gonna be, gonna be drawn. So this is, um, this is good to know, especially if you're going long distances, but I, I'll just tell you right now that for most of the uses that I use these topographic maps for, um, I, I normally don't compensate for that true north versus magnetic north because it's such a such a small distance now if i'm uh, if i'm on the left side of this this big map and i'm trying to find my way to swift silver mine somewhere on the right side then declination is going to be a little bit more important because the farther away you get the more uh, difference there's going to be uh, between magnetic north and and true north This picture here, this is just the, uh, this is gonna be the heart and soul of what these maps can do, what these topographic maps are. And these are the contour lines. Um, and just to, just to give an illustration here, if we're looking at a mountain in profile, let's imagine that we've got a, a large yardstick standing up beside this mountain and our contour interval is 50 feet. So we go up 50 feet and we draw lines at that 50 foot mark. We go up 100 feet and we draw lines at that mark, 150, 200 to 250. And so once you get done, this bottom picture is what you're gonna see. So the top of the peak is gonna be this smaller uh, circle. And then those are gonna be concentric rings that just spread out from there. And that's gonna give you an idea of the elevation. Now, something about this that, that can help you with your, uh, with your navigation is, is every fifth line you'll notice is gonna be a little darker. So if we look right here, this one that says 2,800 feet, that's a dark line. So we, we measure in, we see uh, going five more, another dark line. So that one's gonna be, be 3,000 feet. Uh, we go this way, and, and this one's gonna be uh, 2,600 feet. So that's gonna give you some, some idea of your total elevation above sea level. One way that that can be used in conjunction with more advanced technologies is if you're, if you're standing right in here, and this is a 40 foot contour interval, so this line should be uh, 2,840 feet. Uh, if you think you're standing right in here and you've got um, an altimeter, I have an altimeter app on my phone and it's fairly accurate. If I turn on that altimeter and it tells me that I'm at 1400 feet, then I know that I'm probably not where I think I am. So, so that elevation line is gonna be pretty important. Another thing to look at is, of course the blue is gonna indicate water. If it's a solid line, it's gonna be a a year round stream. If it's a dotted blue line, it's gonna be an intermittent stream that perhaps only runs after a heavy rain. So these are, these are pretty reliable creeks. And you'll notice how those contour lines interact with those creeks. You get this V shape. So normally you see that V shape, that's gonna indicate a creek, it's gonna in indicate a canyon, a holler, um, heading up to the top of the ridge. What can you all say about um, these contour lines? If you can see my cursor, I hope you can. But I'm up here at this peak and I'm moving this way. What can you say about 
this line of travel versus this one here? It's more gentle. Yes. The farther apart those contour lines are, the gentler that slope is going to be. So when you've got these that are very close together, that's going to be a lot steeper. Um, maybe a shorter distance, but it may not be something that you necessarily want to want to walk up or, or walk down. And given the fact that there are creeks here, I would also assume that there's going to be a lot of rhododendron and things that you're going to have to move through. Whereas if you're, if you're up in here, you're going to be coming down this point. It's not going to be nearly as bad on your knees. It's going to be a little bit easier to, to walk across and navigate. So if you have somebody who's injured and you're trying to get them to civilization, maybe you're trying to get them down here to this road, um, you don't necessarily want to take the shortest distance. You may be able to look at this, and this is just using the map by itself. Uh, you may be able to take them down a, a slope that's a little more gentle and, and get them down here to this road and, and save yourself some wear and tear coming down these steep slopes. Now this line that you see here, we've got a solid line with a couple of dots. That's the state line. So here you've got Virginia and over here Kentucky. And that would make sense because that line is going to be at these peaks. So this is the main ridge coming through here. And this is what we would refer to as points coming off the ridge. And when I was with the Kentucky Division of Forestry, lots of times that's how I would check myself to make sure I was where I thought I was. If I was walking along this ridge and I'd get where I thought I was right in here, I could say, well, there should be a point going off um, just, just a little, maybe 190, 200 degrees down this way. And, uh, and if it was, it was going more to the due east, then I would think, well, maybe I'm not in the spot where I think I am. But that's just a simple way I would try to check myself when I was, uh, when I was out in the woods. So looking at that same section of map, um, I think we've, we've kind of talked about this, but let, let's say that we're up on this point here at point A. What could you say about the line of travel down to B versus the line of travel down to C? Even though A to B is a lot longer, I would a lot rather take that hike than going from A to C. Yes. Yeah, and that's, uh, I would I would agree 100% on that. This is gonna be, uh, you know, I'm every year my knees feel it a little bit more when I walk down these steep slopes. Uh, this is gonna be much gentler to walk down. And, uh, you know, if you're, if you're trying to get to a creek for, for whatever reason, maybe, um, get into a water source or looking for a place to, to fly fish, whatever you're doing, I'd, I'd much rather walk down this than this. And again, not just the terrain, but given that this is a creek and this is the, uh, the steep sides of a creek, I would assume that the vegetation is gonna be, be very different here too. Um, now well, I would point out that that map that you showed, um, I've actually been on a rescue in that uh, part of that map um, and uh, your um, suggestion that there's a lot of laurel in those drains is spot on and pointing out those close contour lines in particular in on Pine Mountain and some of the places where we live those indicate cliff lines and uh, so um, that's bad Creek, I think, or, or bad branch on the, um, I think it's, it's bad branch, but not the bad branch where the falls is. This is the one that uh, comes down into North Fork of Pound. Right. And um, anyway, some of those uh, close contour lines that are up around 2800 that's towards the middle of the map, um, uh -huh. those, those are actually cliff lines. Um, another thing, we talked about the contour interval we saw at the bottom of the map is 40. Now I've seen some maps that have an 80 foot contour interval. I think that was, that was around the Smokies is where those were with the, with the very steep uh, rugged mountains. Um, I've also seen some that are five foot contour intervals. 
when you get out more into the plains areas and they may go down even smaller than that. But keeping that contour interval in mind, um, that, that's gonna be good to know because if you're looking at a, a map from the Midwest, that's a five foot contour interval versus what's here in Wise and Letcher County and it's got a 40 foot contour interval, then you're, you might be tempted to say, well, uh, this Nebraska cornfield is roughly the same terrain as what we're seeing in Wise County, but, but that's all relative, that those contour lines uh, they try to pick the interval that's going to show the terrain the best. So, uh, so most of the ones I see around here are, are 40 foot contour intervals. So every time you come to another line, there's a 40 foot change in elevation. Okay. We'll talk about uh, just a few slides here about the, the compass alone and um, and the one you see on the left, this is this is mine that I've had for years. I was required to to buy one of these when I was in college, going through the the forestry program, and I think I paid uh, thirty dollars for this, and I just thought that was outrageous. And I think these are closer to sixty five or seventy dollars now. This is a um, a Silva compass, and which is Silva and Sunto are, are the two that I would recommend as far as the the higher end, the rugged compass. The one that's on the right there, I bought several of these to do a kids program several years ago, and um, and they make a, a better compass that's the same size and same shape. But this one was just uh, it was dirt cheap. One of them I picked up today. This this bezel wouldn't even turn, and the others they're very loose. So when you shake them, that that bezel will turn too much. But but this is what's called a map reading compass or a base plate compass. That's both of these are. And, and again, you'll have this clear base plate. You'll have a bezel that turns. Um, and, and they're just designed so that you can use these in conjunction with a compass. If you look at these base plates, if you look at those graduations around the edge, you'll see here at the bottom, this is, is set up for that seven and a half minute series. Uh, it says one to 24,000. That was the scale on the, uh, on the map that I showed you. And so it's already set up. So if I measure out this length, I know that that's a quarter of a mile. If I measure from here to here, I know it's three quarters of a mile. So it's already set up for that. Um, I can, I can go ahead and, and just figure out what I've, what I've got. One of the things that uh, makes this compass different. Another thing that makes it different from some of the compasses that you may have dealt with before is this entire plate, this entire circle doesn't turn. It just has a needle that will point to true north and then it's got this uh, rotating bezel that you turn. You use it to orient yourself with the map or with your surroundings. And, um, and this is one that I'd recommend if you want to start doing some orienteering or using a map and compass, I would get myself a base plate compass uh, to to, to utilize. Um, you don't have to pay for, for this, this fancy compass. You can get a good Silva or, um, or Sunto base plate compass that's made more like this one. I think somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 or $20 is, is what you'd find those for. Just some terminology that you may run across. You'll hear me talking about bearings. Um, what Technically, what I'm going to be uh, talking about when I say a barren is, is technically an azimuth because there are different types of compasses. You have the compasses that go from zero at north down to 180 at south, 270 at west, all the way back to zero. Then you also have compasses, and once upon a time I had, had one of these as well that's just divided into 90 degree angles. So you've got, it goes from zero degrees to 90 degrees at east, and then it starts counting down 90 degrees to zero degrees south, and then zero to 45 again, or zero to 90 again, and then 90 back down to zero. And so if I'm giving somebody an azimuth and I say go 45 degrees, uh, or if I say go 135 degrees, the, the technical bearing would be go south 45 degrees east but it's the same concept, it's just different terminology. I would say as somebody who's, who's new to compasses and new to navigation, 
I would definitely go for an azimuth compass to get this type of, of graduation around that, uh, around that circle. Uh, but you may run across something that, that's going to have these, uh, this type of, uh, of nomenclature on it. So as far as using the compass just by itself, um, one of the, one of the things you can do is, is if you're, if you're standing at a particular spot and you want to give somebody a, a bearing or an azimuth to a particular feature. So I'm standing here in my yard and I'm, I'm pointing this compass at this power pole here. And you'll notice that we're at this point, we're not paying any attention to that needle. I'm just lining up that compass. The front of the compass is going to be your direction of travel. So, so just use some compass discipline. Don't, don't be turning your compass around. The front of it is always the direction that you want to be heading in. So I've got my compass pointed at this target here of this power pole. And then at that point, once I'm all lined up, then I will turn that bezel until what we say the red is in the shed, until those printed lines, that printed arrow lines up with that needle. And you know, I'm still holding, I'm still got my compass pointed at that power pole. And then at that point I can look down and I can tell the exact bearing or the asthma to that power pole from the spot where I'm standing. And each of these little graduations is two degrees. So we're looking at about 85 degrees is what we would see here. If I um, then had somebody stand here at the spot where I was standing, I said, maybe we're hiding Easter eggs. And I say, you can find an Easter egg at, at 85 degrees. And they should be able to, to orient their compass and go to that exact line of sight. So again, a little closer look here. This is what we call the red in the shed. You've, you've turned this, this bezel until the needle lines up with the printed arrow that's on the compass. And then at that point, at the back of the compass, we can read our azimuth or our bearing and, and determine which direction we're, we're facing. Uh, I want to give an example here of a practical application, something that could, uh, a compass like this could be used for. This is my in-laws neighborhood over in, in Pikeville. And this house right here, this is where my wife's grandfather lived. And he was always talking. He always suspected there was a bee tree up in these woods. And I always told him that, that what we could do is we could put some sugar water out here and the bees would come and visit that or, or honey or something that would attract the bees here in his backyard. And then while those bees are feeding, we could throw some powdered sugar or flour on them to make them easier to see. And once they leave, you, you've heard that term beeline. Bees like to go in a straight line back to their colony. So when those left, we could stand there and we could take our compass and we could get an azimuth. And that should tell us if there is a bee tree up there that it would be somewhere along this line of travel. Now that's, that's a long way. And bees may go two miles looking for, uh, for forage. So what you could do is you could also come over here. This is my father-in-law's place. You could do the same thing over here. Put out your sugar water, throw some powdered sugar on those bees, and get a bearing as they leave. And then what you should end up with is you're going to have two lines. And this is called triangulation. You're going to form a triangle here based on these various points. And where these two lines, where these two barons intersect, if there's a bee tree up in those woods, it should be right there at that intersection. You could take this, um, you could convert this to a, a GPS with the, the longitude and latitude lines. And theoretically, you should be able to get right to the point where that bee tree would be. But that can come in handy for a lot of different things. If you're if you're up in here and you don't know where you're at exactly, you could do that backwards. You could, and you could see this house and you could see this house and you could identify those on a map. Then you could get your bearings to each of those and where those intersect would be where you're located. So that I just call triangulation. <clears throat> if you buy yourself one of these, these compasses and you wanna just practice with it, play with it a bit, 
this is a little activity that, that does help you do that and just helps you get better with your compass. But you can just throw down a nickel or if you're, if you're a gambling type, you can throw down a quarter and you can take a bearing, just any bearing, any azimuth that you want to take, preferably on flat ground. <clears throat> and you want to pace out, say 100 paces, then you stop. You can add 120 degrees to that original bearing. You can go another 100 paces, stop, add 120 degrees, and at 100 paces, you should be pretty close to that nickel that you threw down. So, uh, so this is just using um, the, the concept of triangles to get you back to your starting point. This is also going to test your pacing to, to make sure that your pacing is pretty consistent. And that's, uh, that's something that you could work on in the long run is, is making sure that you can judge those distances based on your pace. But this is a good activity to do just uh, if you've never used a, used a compass before and you just want to get some practice, go out into a field, go into a park somewhere and try this out. Just remember, add 120 degrees and try to keep your pace in pretty, pretty consistent and you should get right back to your starting point. <clears throat> this is a, uh, an activity, and I'll show you the book that this came from. This is called The Schoolyard Compass Game. And I've set this up numerous times for uh, every, everybody from fourth graders on up to adults. And, uh, and I've got the, the schematics of how to set it up, but, but basically it takes two people. You go to a, an area in a big field, and you, you, you measure out a certain azimuth or a certain distance and you put out a surveyor's flag and you put a letter on it. And then you do the same for all, uh, I guess, eight of these locations. And you end up with this huge circle with all these surveyor flags with different letters. And you, you give the students or the adults, you give them a, a compass and you give them a, a sheet of paper that has a starting point. And it may say, well, you want to go to letter O and, and go 30 degrees. And so they're going to look, they're going to use their compass, and they're going to have to decide if that is pointing towards U or L. And they'll go to the next one and from there, and they keep going. And when they get finished, they should come up with a particular code. And, um, and so this, this particular case, they started here at E. They were given a certain bearing on their, their piece of paper. And so they had to decide if that, that bearing was taking them to A or P. So in this case, it was taking them to A. So they travel to A and they write A down on their paper. From A, they, they read another bearing and they have to decide, well, is this bearing taking me to Z or L or U? And this case is taking L, so they write down the L and so on and so forth. And when they get done, they come back and, and you check their code and make sure that they got the exact code that they needed to get. And kids who you wouldn't even think would be interested in compass, once they, once they do this once or twice and they learn the concept, then they keep coming back. They want to try another one and just, just improve their skill. But, um, but this is something, Chris, I thought about this, maybe even Chris and Paxton for the... Um, the, the Pine Mountain Naturalist Rally, this might be an activity that, that uh, we could do for that. But this is a pretty, pretty easy thing to be set up pretty quickly, and it's a good way to test, test your compass skill and have a little fun in the meantime. Okay, now finally talking about uh, using a map and compass together. Um, you, you've got some basic skill with the compass. You know a few things about the map. Well, how do you make those talk to each other? And that's where the, I showed you earlier the declination. Um, this, is, this is what kind of declination that you're gonna see. If you're over in California, you may see uh, uh, you, the declination, the, the direction that that uh, compass needle is gonna point, it may be 15 degrees uh, different from, uh, from what, uh, what true north is gonna be. Around here, we're, we're closer to five degrees declination, and this does change over time. I, I, this is the most recent one, and uh, the map that I have from 1980, it was showing us about four degrees west declination here. But again, if you're only traveling short distances, I wouldn't worry about it too much, but if you're, if you're going long stretches, 
on these uh, topographic maps, then you may have to adjust for declination. And probably the simplest way to do that, if you've got this particular seven and a half minute series map, just take a yardstick and lay it so that that straight edge lines up with this magnetic north line and take a pencil and draw a line all the way up the map and then come over a couple inches, draw a parallel line to that and do that all across your map. And that way your map's gonna be oriented based on that declination, it's gonna correct for it. Another thing you can do, this is the back of my compass. Um, it does have a little screw with a little uh, screwdriver attached to the lanyard. You can turn that screw and you can go ahead and set that declination for whatever you need it to be. I've done that a few times, but I honestly, these days I don't, I don't even mess with it much because I don't really need that much accuracy for a lot of what I do. But it is possible with the, with some of the better compasses to adjust that declination right there on the tool without having to, to adjust it on the map. <clears throat> so, uh, so using the map and compass together, again, we're looking at, this is the Phillips Creek area. Um, this, I think, is the last picnic pavilion up at Phillips Creek. And then over here, we have Laurel Fork Cemetery. If we just had the map by itself, we could, we could probably find an easy way to walk over to the Laurel Fork Cemetery. But let's say for whatever reason, we wanna know the most direct, the straight line from this Phillips Creek Pavilion over to Laurel Fork Cemetery. Well, the way we would do that is we would just lay our base plate compass down so that we're using this straight edge. And again, the front of the compass is gonna be our direction of travel. So we've got that lined up, and you'll notice that this arrow here, this printed arrow, we're not gonna pay attention to the needle at this point. This, this painted arrow that's on here, it's, it's not lined up with the map. So we turn that, and now we are. We would line these lines up with the grid north on the map, or if we've drawn our declination lines, we would line those up so they're parallel with those declination lines. And then at that point, we can look up here. And this is probably, these are, are five degrees for each one of these. So this is probably 55 degrees. So we know that if we stand at this pavilion and we point ourselves 55 degrees and we follow that line, that's eventually gonna take us right to the Laurel Fork Cemetery. And again, at this point, we haven't paid any attention to the needle. But where the needle comes in handy, we would stand up, we would put our compass flat in front of us here at this pavilion, and we would turn our bodies. Uh, again, compass discipline, you don't want to turn your compass around, you always want it pointing the direction that you're going to be traveling. So we would pivot around our bodies until the red is in the shed, and that will tell us that the magnetic north is lined up with the azimuth that we've set on the, the, the compass. And once that red is in the shed, we could, we could start walking the way the compass is pointing us and we would eventually walk right into Laurel Fork Cemetery. Um, I think here I was just gonna say, I was just talking about triangulation again. Let's say you're, you're out in the woods and you, you come to a creek you don't know if you're at this creek or this creek or this one or this one or this one. You just know that you're at a creek and maybe you can see, um, I don't know if there are any features up on May King Knob that you could see, but let's say that you could see a fire tower and you know that it's on May King Knob. Well, you can get an azimuth to that and maybe you can see a feature up on this ridge and you know where it, it is, so you get an azimuth to that and you can use triangulation based on those two azimuths and you can pinpoint exactly where you are. So that's just a, a little bit backwards from the triangulation um, I showed you earlier with the, with the bee tree, but, uh, but that's just a way you can use those two together. Now this is the, the book. It's got that schoolyard compass game. It's got a lot of good information uh, written by Bjorn Kellstrom. Uh, very, very good book, very interesting read. This is one, if you're interested in using a map and compass, this is one I would highly recommend. I think there's also a University of Kentucky publication that talks about orienteering. Um, 
either Shad or Jeremy, I think, might be posting that in the, the comment box. But that's a good one to have, a um, good one to, to practice with. And if you get really good at it and you want to take it up a notch, there is such thing as competitive orienteering. And some people are pretty diehard with this. It's you go out into natural areas and somebody will set up a course with all these markers hung in different places and they'll give you a map and you'll have two hours or four hours or, or whatever to go visit as many of these as you can. And each one will have a little thing dangling on it, it looks like a stapler. And, and you'll punch that into the, into the number that you went to and there's going to be a particular shape just so that the judges can then confirm that you went to the right markers. And, um, and like I said, some people are pretty, pretty serious about this. So, uh, so it's a, it's a pretty fun activity to do. Um, good way to, to practice your orienteering skills. Okay. Any questions? Let me see if I can get into the chat box here. I think there was something earlier. Oh, that was just the, uh, Shad had, had shared the, uh, UK publication. Um, and, uh, Jaquita had mentioned geocaching. That's, that gets a lot of people into uh, backcountry navigation. So geocaching is a good way to get out and, and practice your navigation skills. That's, that's for sure. Uh, let's see. Shad had asked. You covered all of it. I didn't know you were going to hit on setting that screw on the bezel and the fact that magnetic north was changing. So. Okay. All right. All right. And then uh, I think uh, Shad may, may be able to offer some comments on this last slide. We we're going to say a few things about, about communications in the backcountry when you're doing a backpacking trip or maybe you're going on a hunting trip for several days, staying in touch with uh, the people back home. Um, I know for me, some of the places I go, I do have cell service. So, so my practice has been, I would keep my cell phone turned off until a certain time of day and I would turn it on and I'd send a text, say, Hey, I'm okay. Um, that's not always possible. I don't always have a signal and, and the people back home realize that it is possible to invest in a satellite phone, which uh, is not based on cell towers. It communicates by, by satellite, but uh, they're, they're very expensive. I've noticed they, they've come down a lot. They used to be, extremely expensive, but they are, they are affordable. So if you spend a lot of time in the back country, that's something that you might consider. Uh, personal locator beacons. I can tell you something I read about that a few years ago. I think it was in backpacker magazine, but what those are just a little device, like a GPS unit. They're, they're tied in with satellites. And if you get lost or if you get hurt and you need assistance, you, you just activate that. You keep it in the sleep stage until you need to activate it. And then that sends out an SOS signal and it gives people your coordinates. And, and that way the rescuers can come directly and help you out. What I had read about, there was a guy who, he's one of the first people that used one of these, these beacons. He was on a, a couple week backpacking trip and he got lost and he got hurt and he activated his beacon and, and sure enough, the rescuers came and they got him out of there and they were all patting themselves on the back and the, the manufacturer was talking about how great it is that, that that saved this person. Well, a couple of weeks later, he decided to go back and recover his gear that he had left and he ended up having to activate it again. He got lost again. And so, so people started thinking, well, you know, this can be misused. Maybe it's, and, and there's a cost involved when you have these rescuers come out. Uh, normally you, you do have to have to, to pay those rescuers. Somebody has to, has to pay them. Some people shouldn't be in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Um, this one I, I think has a lot of potential, uh, the satellite emergency notification device. And I think the one in the center is an example of that. I noticed that uh, some outfitters had those for, in the hundred dollar range. Um, and, and basically the way those work is, uh, you just send a text, 
just like you would with your cell phone. You can send a text to a designated person back home and um, um, it, it works by satellite. You don't need, need cell service. You, you can send a text, say, I'm okay. And um, the ones that I saw, you've got a certain number of credits. So you buy this unit for a hundred bucks, you pay $15 and you get 10 credits. So you're able to send 10 texts. Um, that might be enough for your trip. And then next time you pay another $15 and get 10 more credits. But, uh, but that's, if, if you want to stay in touch with the folks back home, then that's a, might be something to consider. And then we're hopefully going to have a session on amateur radio, also called ham radio down the road. That might be another option. The big negative with amateur radio is you do have to have a license in order to use that. But, um, but it's a pretty straightforward process to get your license and be able to, to communicate that way. So you just take a, take an exam. There's a person here in Wise County that's been trying to encourage more and more people to get their amateur radio license. So he's had some classes and, and he's brought the test right here to the town of Wise so that people can come in and take the test and, and then they're cleared to, to use the ham radios. Um, the only thing I'll add about that is uh, carry some type of backup charger because none of these things are going to do you any good if the battery's dead. These all rely on batteries, so so some kind of backup charger. And uh, and Shad, I think you had a comment about if you can't communicate, maybe have a have a meeting place lined up. Well, I was going to say a couple of things. Uh, everything that uh, Phil has pointed out here is kind of where the the current trends are going. People are big into gadgetry and uh, electronics and they definitely bring a lot to the table. But don't write off the simple things. Uh, leaving a note on where you intend to go before you leave home so that somebody back home that's responsible will know what time to expect you back. And if you don't show, they know a general area that you intend to, to visit and they have somebody pre-approved uh, that can help locate you. And so um, it's not an easy thing to rescue people. Um, the area that I referred to on Phil's map earlier where there was a rescue and it was actually uh, some wise countyans that uh, one of them broke a leg on the mountain trying to use a GPS uh, to go straight line of sight uh, to pound gap and he encountered that cliff line that I referred you to, and they tried to go down, there were three of them, they tried to go down the cliff line, and the guy fell and had a compound fracture in his leg. And this was during 40 degree weather uh, that was drizzly. And so it took 48 hours for 70 plus people to get that man off the mountain. And by the time we uh, got to him, I, I remember, um, after everybody located him and began the process of kind of staging uh, the way that they were going to pack him up this hill, he was in a Stokes basket, um, which requires at least six people uh, to pack it. And if you're going straight up a mountain, it's brutal. And so we had to do it in teams. And so uh, long story short, this guy looked up at me at one point and said, uh, I don't mean to be ungrateful, but are we about ready to get out of here? Because uh, he had laid there for so long. So uh, leaving notes before you leave um, with somebody trustworthy and then a whistle. When we got up on the mountain that day, it was very foggy and our ability to communicate with one another and try to get everybody to where the gentleman was located uh, was difficult because people had spread out, you know, doing this search to try to find him. And the whistle became uh, key uh, because we could kind of hear where the sound was coming from and home in on that whistle. So if, um, if you got a, a day pack, uh, a lot of times they have a, a buckle in the chest or the sternum area that's got a whistle built into it. But if it doesn't, uh, that might be a good thing to replace so that you've always got a whistle with you. Um, if, I, I guess, in, uh, in alluding to what Phil said, in the event that all else fails, there should be a, a known place that you're going to rendezvous. So if you get separated, um, 
uh, and you can't communicate, then there needs to be a place that everybody will attempt to get to um, to uh, reconnect. So that's important during natural disasters. Uh, and it's, it's true if you're on a hiking trip, you know, if, if somebody uh, kind of falls behind, uh, there needs to be a plan for how you uh, address that. So having that uh, meeting location and then what to do if uh, somebody doesn't show, uh, that becomes critical. And Jaquita had said there's an app also that will uh, send the coordinates uh, to designated recipients during the, the course of the trip that, that'll tell them that you're okay or, or to seek help. Um, there's something going on in my home county right now. There was a lady I know whose uh, 29 year old son was riding ATVs and he got separated from his group and they found his ATV. It still had gas, but there's no sign of him. And tomorrow will be two weeks that he's been missing with, without a trace. And um, I don't know if any of these communication devices would would have helped if, if something sinister is going on, but if it's just a case where he's he's sick or he's hurt, then, uh, then that, that could have made a, a big difference. Okay. Great job, Phil. And uh, I've got a new way to try to find bee trees now. Uh, I told Jeremy that you are a genius. I would have never thought to try to triangulate where that bee tree was. That was great. <laughs> well, uh, and you know, I don't, you're not going to learn all this in just an hour presentation. So, uh, so hopefully when the world gets back to some level of normalcy if, if folks want to get together and do a, a map and compass day or something to put some of this into practice then uh, i'd be, be I, I would love to do that so just uh, stay in touch with me on it when i was in boy scouts we actually had orienteering races and basically they gave us a, a destination and no two teams had the same uh, exact map but it was the compass and pacing and uh, everybody was going to end up at the same finish line. So it was whoever got to the finish line first uh, won. And, that, and we've also got that little kit. Forestry Suppliers has the little uh, flag uh, thing that you showed. And they, they have like a little punch uh, with a yep. card. And you, can, you have to show that you've been to each of the waypoints. So yep. really fun. Yep. Yeah, there's a... I don't know if the group is still in existence, but I, I, once upon a time, there was a group in Australia. They were called Rogaine, uh, and I, I remember that because uh, I was fearful that I would lose my hair one day, but it, it stood for Rugged Outdoor or something, and, and they would do the orienteering, but they would have 40 hours and uh, in very rugged terrain, and the, the ones that were hardest to get to were worth more points, and so these insane people they would turn them loose in 40 hours they would try to visit as many of these sites as they could but they were they were pretty hardcore all right well well thank you all um and what's what's coming up tuesday we have uh keith keith heckworth is going to speak on cover crops on tuesday and thursday forest wind is going to speak on aquaculture and I don't know if it's going to be like pond weeds. Um, we probably need to find out a little more detail from him, but. Um, it's actually going to be about fish, raising fish. All right, very good. And you uh, could have given that talk. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to embarrass her, but tomorrow's the last day for our intern. We hate to see her go, but uh, uh, this, uh, this summer has gone by quick. Um, uh, it was an odd summer, but she adapted well and did a good job for us, and we'll we'll miss her. So, Emily, thank you very much. Thanks, Emily. Thank you. I'm going to miss it. Best of luck. Thank you. Great stuff tonight. A lot of information. All right. Well, I'm going to navigate my old self to the kitchen and get something to eat so you all have a have a good evening thank you great job